I just want to talk for a moment about uh, the president of the Mises Institute, Doug French. You know, Doug, as I mentioned last night, comes from Kansas. Um, he was a champion football player in college. Uh, ended up in, in Nevada, in, in uh, uh, the Las Vegas area, where he went into banking. Uh, as he became increasingly successful in banking, uh, it was recommended to him that he get a master's, either an MBA or a, a master's in economics, and it's to the great uh, benefit of the Mises Institute and the Austrian school that he decided he was going to get a master's in economics. Also to the great benefit of the Austrian school and uh, the Mises Institute that when he, uh, a friend of his said, uh, whatever you do, don't take Rothbard. <laughs> so... Uh, he didn't pay any attention, he took Rothbard, and uh, sort of the rest is history. He got his master's uh, under Murray, uh, wrote a, uh, a thesis on bubbles, and um, I want to mention something very special about him, though. You know, as, as, as Doug mentioned when he was talking about Jim Wolfe the other night, uh, everything we do here is only made possible through our donors. Obviously, we have to have great scholars, we have to have great students, uh, but if we don't have the great donors... Uh, nothing else happens. And so we have um, Jim Wolfe. I don't know, is Jim here right now? But Jeremy Davis, there's Jeremy over there. We have other wonderful donors here. Uh, but I want to mention something uh, very unusual about Doug French. He is himself a major donor to the Institute. And when he was in banking, a very, very generous donor. So uh, um, he's a man who put his money where his mouth is and uh, where his heart is, where his beliefs are. And uh, so it makes us, uh, everybody at the Mises Institute, uh, very, very glad that he's our president. So now, uh, Mr. Doug French. Well, thank you, Lou. It, it's, um, I appreciate the mention of back when I was a successful banker. <laughs> um, and... And now I'm an ex-unsuccessful uh, banker, as these things go. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I should tell all of you young people, when you make some money, go ahead and give it away. Because you're just going to fiddle around and lose it in some bubble and bust anyway. <laughs> so just, uh, but, uh, you know, how could I uh, not support the Mises Institute and uh, support uh, what Lou and Murray built? because um, I felt like I was struck by lightning, literally, by running into uh, Murray. Well, um, I did a poll, a um, very informal poll, on what I should talk about tonight, since I'm talking about the bubble economy. And I could either talk about old bubbles, which I wrote my thesis on, or I could talk about new bubbles, and the consensus was I should talk about new bubbles. And so I thought I would talk about the, you know, the Vegas story um, because uh, despite having learned about bubbles and written about bubbles under Murray, I went ahead and participated in one of the biggest ones of all time as a construction lender in Las Vegas. So um, that's the story I'm going to talk about tonight. And uh, again, I think it's instructive from a uh, Austrian business cycle point of view. Uh, believe me, I am uh, not one to go long um, on my speaking engagements. I know I'm the only person standing between you and alcohol later. Um, and, um, you know, it's hard to compete with Tom Woods and Bob Murphy talking about keg stands and, and uh, karaoke. So uh, that's another reason why I have to talk about Vegas and strippers. <laughs> so, um, so there we go. Um, something I know something about, anyway. And by the way, when you're getting a beer tonight, notice that we have some beer glasses for sale. And um, you guys haven't really taken to them like I thought you would. So uh, anyway, you'll have the chance to buy very neat beer glasses with Rothbard, Hayek. I just can't imagine what Murray would have said when he saw this great beer glass with his likeness on it, enemy of the state. I mean, he'd just go, oh, Douglas, that's the best idea you ever had. 
So anyway, please, please humor me and buy, uh, buy one of these glasses. But anyway, to start the story, um, actually with the Federal Reserve, as all stories start, and um, because they, uh, they've created money out of nowhere uh, profusely since 1971 uh, when uh, Nixon cut the last ties to the gold standard. And M2 grew from $683 billion August of 71 to over 12 times that amount in May of this year. So we've had tremendous monetary growth um, during this period of time. So one of the things you need for a bubble is to have excessive monetary growth. We certainly have that. Now, if I can take you back to May of to, uh, 2000, some of you were in grade school, I guess, um, and the Fed funds rate was 6.5%, not terribly high as these things go, um, but um, the economy was entered into a, a bit of a recession. And then, of course, we knew what happened on 9-11. And the Fed panicked after 9-11, and they slashed, began slashing rates. Um, and I remember 9-11 very clearly. Um, uh, we saw it on the news, and the, uh, uh, Deanna, my girlfriend, were at the time worked uh, at uh, the Venetian. You remember the just the cancellation of, uh, of uh, conventions. We're just rolling in. She's calling me, oh, this one canceled, that one canceled. And uh, we really thought Vegas was going to be in a bad way. And home builders just stopped pulling permits, just stopped. They, the town really thought it was going to be in trouble. So that's what happened. But then the Fed slashed rates. And, um, and ultimately, they would lower the rates down to 1% on June 25th of, of 2003. But I wanted to give you a little idea. In 2000, in Clark County, Nevada, uh, where Las Vegas is, uh, the population was 1.4 million, and there were 20,000 new homes sold and about 30,000 existing homes sold. So that's just short of 50,000 new homes. And the existing uh, home median price was 134000 And the new home median was 155000 Not that you need to remember those numbers. It's not going to come up on a test. Uh, someone asked me earlier if they should attend this lecture. And I told her, no, none of it would be on the test. And I don't see her in the crowd, so I think she took my <laughs> advice. She's off studying for the exam, which is probably the smart thing to do rather than hear my old war stories, I suppose. So anyway, you have Clark County, Nevada, um, Las Vegas, population 1.42 million, and you've got these uh, home prices in the mid-100s. Um, and then, um, but there were 6,000 people a month moving to Vegas. Imagine 200 people a day were moving into Las Vegas. It was a very, very um, hot place to go. Uh, to start a new career. And because of that, um, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, had to start um, auctioning land. Because even though you may not think so, there's a shortage of land around Las Vegas. Now, if you fly in, you're going to tell me, Doug, you're crazy. There's land as far as I can see. The government owns 90% of it. So you couldn't build on it. So the BLM started to um, have these auctions, and um, in May of 2001, they auctioned the 1,900-acre uh, parcel for $47 million, which was $26,672 per acre, $26,672. Coincidentally, in 2001, we bought our home. Um, and to buy a home, we had to actually get into a lottery. It's not like if you wanted to buy a new home, you, you had to get your name on a list. They had to pull your name out. Oh, lucky you, you get to buy one of our homes in our subdivision. I mean, that's how hot the market was, even in 2001. 
So then in November of 2002, they had another BLM auction, and the average price was $160,000 per acre. So we've gone from $26,000 an acre to $160,000 per acre. And the new home, or the median price of a new home in Las Vegas hit $200,000. And that was a doubling in about 14 months. So the Fed had hit the gas, people started buying, people are moving into Vegas, and the price of housing has, has doubled. And as we can see, the price of land has uh, gone up four or five fold. By June uh, 5th of 2003, this is the month that the Fed funds had lowered its ra- or the Fed had lowered its rate to 1%. The Bureau of Land Management has another land auction, and the average price had risen to 233,452 per acre. So again, we're up to about 10 times the amount of just the auction two years prior uh, to that. And by the way, um, industrial uh, space for industrial um, buildings, the vacancy was 3.3%. Um, just uh, office rents were very low. Um, everything was just uh, going great. In fact, um, by 2004, uh, there were only tw- 2,500 homes on the MLS per population of about a uh, million and a half people. There were stories about people trying to buy homes, and they couldn't get anybody to sell them a house. So there was a couple that camped out at Home Depot one Saturday, and they figured if they hung around the sign area, homes for sale, for sale by owner, that they would spot somebody buying one of those signs. (laughs) And sure enough, they did. A couple came up and said, oh, we're going to do this. The couple pounced on them immediately and said, do you want to sell your house? They go, yeah, of course. Can we follow you home? (laughs) They followed him home and bought the house. So that's how hot the housing market was. And in 2004, the BLM auction... Oh, come on in, guys. Don't worry. (laughs) Oh, sure, my pleasure. (laughs) The, BL- <laughs> the BLM had another auction, and by this time, and I should have said back in 2001 when uh, land went for 26000 an acre, there was about two, do- two dozen people in the room. Hardly anybody showed up. The only people who showed up were the people who actually wanted to buy. So by 2004, when you had a BLM auction, they had to move it to, uh, by that time it was a Sam's Town in their uh, little showroom. And there was 2,000 people showed up and 460 bidders. So you inevitably had all these people who, you know, thought that they were going to buy a piece of Nevada real estate and get rich. And I remember sitting by one couple, because I used to go to these things. The theater was just, just great to watch these things. And so I sat next to this little couple, and they proudly had their little card, you know, that they're going to... I said, you're going to bid on some property? They go, yeah. yeah. I said, do you know what you want to buy? Oh, yeah, we got two and a half acres right here. Um, they say the minimum bid's 100000 an acre or 250000 We think we can get it for that. I said, okay. So the bidding started for that parcel, and uh, they never got the card off their lap. The parcel went for 500000 and was sold in 38 seconds by my unofficial timing. So if you wanted to buy property at that time, you really, really wanted to uh, have to buy it. By that time, the average price per acre was $280,000. So remember back in May 2001, average price, 26000 an acre. Now we're up to two hundred and eighty. Thousand an acre. They sold um, seven hundred and seven million dollars worth of land that day. The appraisal, because they start these auctions at the appraised price, the appraised price of that land was three hundred and nine million 
So it ended up selling for more than double the amount of the appraised value. But that's how hot it was. You just couldn't, you couldn't go wrong with uh, Nevada real estate. And in 2005, remember back in 01, there were about 50,000 homes sold. In 2005, there were uh, 93,000 homes sold between new homes and, uh, and existing homes. And, you know, the town, it wasn't just real estate. I mean, the whole town was on fire. I remember, uh, I remember uh, the Rolling Stones had a, con- a concert there, and uh, the sponsor of the conf- uh, concert was the, uh, was the sponsors of the American Dream. Do you remember who the sponsors of the American Dream were? AmeriQuest Mortgage. Of course, Ameriquest Mortgage isn't uh, in and around anymore, but they were the con- uh, they were the sponsors of the of the uh, of the Stones tour that year, and a seat on the ninth row in the secondary market went for fifty five hundred dollars to see the Stones in Vegas. And you know, I, I wrote a piece about uh, if you wanted to write if you wanted to go have a steak before the concert. The average steak in Vegas was 50 bucks for a steak. Uh, the highest steak in town was, a, of course, Kobe beef. It was all the rage. Uh, it was $190. And if you think we weren't living the high life, well, I remember going to a party um, at my boss's house, and he served for hors d'oeuvres, Kobe beef, cutting it. Boy, was it good. Uh, I don't know if uh, Bob Murphy's here, but he was mentioned in ATM uh, fees um, and people complaining about spending a dollar on ATM fees to get their own money. Um, and um, at the time, at um, Scores Gentlemen's Club, uh, the ATM fees uh, were not a dollar. They weren't $2. They weren't $5. They were 10% of your withdrawal amount. And you couldn't withdraw ten dollars. You could dr- withdraw anything from a hundred to five hundred. So there were plenty of people pulling out five hundred bucks and paying the fifty dollars to do it at the time. Uh, not necessarily that I knew where the ATM machine was in <laughs> scores. It's now Rick's Cabaret, publicly traded uh, gentleman's cabaret. But if you do go in the front door, go to your right, and then kind of go back, back toward the restroom. Um, anyway, and strip club patrons were so valued at that time, and actually still are, that cab drivers were paid $100 a head just to take guys or girls, as the case may be, to these clubs. So if a cab driver could get four or five guys in their cab, he would pull up, and the strip club would pay him $500. As you might expect, there would be, little old, uh, there would be older couples looking for dinner somewhere, and they would end up at a gentleman's club. <laughs> um, and, of course, they've tried to legislate this out of existence, but the cab drivers are very, very powerful in, uh, in Las Vegas. Um, the labor market was so tight at the time that retailers couldn't find help for holiday uh, uh, for their holiday um, staffing. Headhunters at Citibank were actually pretending uh, to be um, shoppers in malls for big ticket items so that they could find employees for their credit card center, which is in Las Vegas. Uh, Vegas restaurants were struggling to find people. In fact, uh, at least one cafe owner was offering $150 to any employee who could bring them an employee. Um, Local employers um, had to fend off the strip strip hotel and casinos. Um, Any good employee could get stolen away from them at any time. So it was just an incredibly, incredibly... uh, tight um, labor market at the time. Again, you have this huge boom going on. Um, the whole country's in a boom. Vegas is in a boom. People are getting 
uh, exotic mortgages on their house. They're pulling out equity. They're coming to Vegas and spending it. And uh, they're even thinking about buying a timeshare. And the uh, local university, UNLV, where I went uh, and studied under the likes of Murray Rothbard and, and of course, Hans Hoppe was on my committee as well. Um, but uh, UNLV at the time, this is in 2005, decided to uh, offer classes in timeshare resort sales. This was actually coursework that they were putting together. And uh, they were hoping to have uh, a major in timeshare sales um, over, the course of, uh, over the course of a few years. I don't think that ever worked out. Uh, I think the, the whole timeshare thing kind of blew up before they could get that uh, timeshare program in place. But uh, again, people were uh, streaming into Vegas. And by 2005, we had 7,200 people a month moving in to Vegas. So it was 10 people an hour were moving in. And the population in 05 was uh, 1.7 million. And at the time, people were predicting that uh, there would be 4 million people in Las Vegas by 2027. They were just extrapolating out the numbers and and uh, people were going to live, uh, come to Vegas and live you know, forever. Um, and, of course, about that time, the, the high-rise condo market uh, began, to, uh, began to take shape. Uh, it was called the Manhattanization of Vegas. And, again, as I had mentioned earlier, there was a, a shortage of land uh, because the BLM owned most of it. So they began to build high-rises. And, of course, everybody, uh, the thought was, is that uh, everyone was going to want a high-rise apartment on Las Vegas Strip. And um, so the thing around town is, if you were in the know, is that you would try to get yourself on the list to buy a high-rise. Not that you ever wanted to live there, but um, you could make a bunch of money at this, of course. And I remember talking to a, um, our favorite banquet captain, uh, who uh, who told me one night uh, we were at some event down on the strip, and uh, he said he had uh, deposits down on four high rise units. And of course, he didn't intend to move into any of these, but he whispered to me, "You know, they will only go up in price." Well, uh, I did see him subsequent to that. I don't think any of the projects that he had deposits on ever got finished and at least one or two of them never got started. So, uh, but there was a condo craze. Uh, uh, quite a few were built. There were 40 projects on the drawing board. Uh, a few, uh, less than half of them got built. Trump got his built, and the Donald has closed a total of about 20% of his units. Um, and of course, uh, City Center, which we'll get to later, uh, has closed a mere fraction of, uh, of the units that they have uh, available. But uh, for those of you who have read this great book by Michael Lewis called The, uh, the Big Short, um, there was uh, some of the people who began to make a lot of, or investigate, making a lot of money um, investing in uh, collateralized uh, debt swaps, um, CDS market. You know, there was the this idea that uh, they found extraordinary that uh, they had met a stripper who had five houses. Well, every, every stripper I ever met had five houses. So, I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't unusual. And um, everybody, got in a real, you know, everybody got in a real estate business. Um, perfectly good, upstanding cocktail waitresses, bartenders, they all went to real estate school so they could sell real estate. And at one time, there was one realtor for every 100 people in Vegas, uh, probably an oversupply. Um, and it was about this time uh, the banking was very hot. Uh, the valuation of banks was, uh, you generally look at banks from a valuation uh, standpoint on their, uh, uh, some multiple of book value, book being, you know, assets minus liabilities. And um, there were banks trading at three times book, three and a half times book, four times book. 
And, uh, and in fact, I remember hearing a speech from a friend of mine. He said, if you can get approved for a new bank, the minute you get approved, uh, your money is worth one and a half times uh, what you put in it. And once you break, turn a profit, um, your money is worth two and a half times, three times. Um, it was about this time that I saw a website um, called StartYourOwnBank.com. <laughs> People ask me for signs of a bubble. <laughs> that would be one of them. <laughs> Whatever you own, <laughs> and then you see start your own, whatever, you know, dot com, then you know uh, we're in trouble. Uh, even at that time, um, in, you know, casino stocks were going crazy. And uh, uh, one, one stock that's very near and dear to our, uh, well, let's just say our family has a, you know, a rooting interest in this thing, uh, you know, uh, LVS, Las Vegas Sands. Um, it went um, it went public at 29, the first day of trading. The first trade, I think, was at 60. Um, it ended up going to $148 a share. And, of course, you talk to senior management at the time, it's going to go to 200 a share. Um, in January of last year, it traded um, at $1.48, I think. Um, it has since rebounded, and it's trading about 25 bucks a share. Um, Sheldon Adelson had to put in uh, a million bucks of his own money to keep the company alive. But that was, um, that was it was not just real estate in Vegas that was going crazy. Uh, certainly, um, casino stocks um, and uh, everything, everything in town. Uh, was doing doing very very well. So um, we now get to um, March of 2006, and I don't know if you remember, but uh, it was actually back in 2004 that the Fed began to raise rates. Greenspan began to you know tap the brakes. I guess he was still around at that point. And he began to um, he began to raise rates. Uh, by the way, by the way, the unemployment rate in Vegas was uh, uh, was three and a half percent in two thousand and four. So all these stories I tell about a very tight labor market it was uh, certainly indicated in uh, um, in a very very low unemployment rate. But uh, Bernanke hit the brakes. Um, but what had started also was cas uh, additional casino development um, while rates were low. And by March of 2006, there were 38 cranes on the skyline of Las Vegas, 38 high-rise cranes. And at, the, at that time, there were $25 billion worth of projects either in progress or considered imminent. $25 billion worth of pro projects. There wasn't any place really on earth with that kind of development in, uh, in place. But interestingly enough, the housing market had already begun to soften. And as I had described earlier, where if you wanted to buy a new home, you actually had to win a lottery to, uh, to buy a house. Um, by this time, uh, new home developments were paying 8% commissions to outside brokers to, um, to generate activity for them. Cancellations were high. Traffic was half what it had previous been. But still, uh, the BLM held an auction, and it sold 3,000 acres for just under $800 million. And um, by this time, these auctions were so big that we had Gail Norton coming out. She was Secretary of Interior or whatever. Uh, Bush wanted some of the money to pay for whatever war he had going on. Um, I mean, everybody wanted part of this booty because it, they were just selling, selling this land for incredible amounts. So 
by early 2006, the median price of a home, remember where we started, 134000 for existing, 155000 for new back in 2000. Early 2006, median price new home hits 328000 Existing median hits 285000 So, um, you know, two and a half times roughly in uh, a five-year five-year period. Uh, t- June 2006, Fed funds was boosted to 5.5%. So we've gone from 1% now up to 55 And of course, Austrian business cycle theory would dictate if, we're, if the bloom is coming off the rose, if the bust is beginning to happen, it's because the Fed has, uh, has withdrawn some of its liquidity, it's raising rates, and that's what's happened. By October of 2006, 20,000 homes were on the MLS. Remember when there was only 2,500 on MLS? By October 2006, there's 20,000 on MLS. There is only one BLM auction held. They only sell 22 and a half acres for $9 million. Essentially, the BLM auctions just completely went bust. However, industrial rents at the time very high. They actually peaked at 78 cents a square foot. The industrial market was still very tight. The retail market, uh, commercial retail market was very tight, um, and same way for office. March of 2007, BLM holds an auction. Only 100 people show up, very few bidders, and only 25 acres is sold for $12 million. And, uh, but the strip is still full of cranes. And by this time, there's $49 billion worth of projects announced. In fact, the highest price ever paid for strip land was paid uh, during this time frame. $1.3 billion uh, for what used to be the site of the Frontier Hotel. It is, uh, they were going to make a, a replica of the Plaza from New York, a company from, from Israel. They bought the land, they knocked down... Uh, this is right out in front of the Trump Tower. Um, they knocked the frontier down, and they were going to build this, uh, uh, this great project. Um, it is still a blank piece of dirt, and uh, I have no idea when they'll be able to, to uh, sell that dirt. So land was still uh, incredibly high. Uh, by this time, the population had grown to 2 million people. Uh, but fewer than 20,000 new homes were sold, Uh, but still the retail vacancy was, again, it was very high. Average land prices around town had hit 900,000 an acre. That's leaving out the strip. You can't include the strip. So if you remember these BLM auctions at 26,000 an acre back in 2000 and 2001, now we've hit average land prices in 07, even though the housing market has, uh, has rolled over. Uh, land is still going for 900000 an acre in the fourth quarter of 2007. And in fact, uh, apartment rents um, hit their high then uh, very quickly in the first quarter of 2008 at uh, $887 a month. So uh, where are we now in Las Vegas? Um, you know, I always like to have props, and this stuff isn't as clever as uh, paper money with Jack Nicholas on it, but I have a friend of mine sending me this, uh, and you can't read this, of course, but this is uh, the notice of defaults for, um, for a month, the month of June, notice of defaults. Unfortunately, I am very familiar with a few of these parcels. <laughs> this is a, a report for June entitled, Who's Lending in Clark County? Here's all the real estate loans made on commercial in June. So compare notice of defaults with the number of loans. That's... Uh, Visually, what's going on? 
Uh, one of the projects, the $49 million that was supposed to happen on the Strip, the Echelon project, Boyd Gaming, if you drive by, it is still on hold, and it is steel. It's just bare steel. Uh, Fountain Blue is a project that uh, has been stopped. It was purchased out of uh, bankruptcy auction by Carl Icahn, and um, he, may, he was rumored to be starting construction. Again, but uh, who knows, when he first bought it, the thought was that he uh, would hold it for five years. He bought it literally for pennies, pennies on the dollar. Uh, the Cosmo, uh, Cosmopolitan, uh, was stopped through a bankruptcy, um, but it's now going to be finished. Um, but there were about 100,000 high-rise con condo units that, never, uh, that were on the drawing board that never started. Uh, City Center, uh, which is uh, a project that started out with a price tag of $5 billion, ended up costing $8.5 billion. This is uh, MGM and uh, Dubai. And they did finish the project. They've only closed a small fraction of the condos that they had for sale, even though they dropped the price by 30%. Station Casinos. Uh, owns a number of local casinos in town. Uh, they filed bankruptcy uh, a couple years ago. They are still in bankruptcy. The Riviera Hotel, you may have heard of, just filed for bankruptcy. Ger General Growth Properties owns virtually all the high-end mall space in Las Vegas. They are in bankruptcy. Um, Herbst Gaming is a local company, uh, is in bankruptcy. Black Gaming, local company, bank bankrupt. Um, Last time I was in town, uh, my dentist told me that over 200 dentists have gone over, gone under in uh, Vegas. Um, by the way, um, den uh, my, my dental hygienist in Vegas tells me that they do not have modern dentistry in Alabama. <laughs> I don't believe that, but that's what they claim, <laughs> that's what they claim in Vegas. Um, Anyway, the lender of the largest uh, new retail project in Vegas is called Town Center. They just had a notice of default filed on that project. The note was $475 million. Uh, the high-end retail project in Henderson, which is right next to Vegas, just had a notice of default filed on it. That is a $70 million note. Uh, Well-located uh, project on the Strip. Um, or just west of the Strip, $430 million note uh, foreclosed upon. There's 20,000 houses on the MLS. Of course, Vegas is number one in the country for, uh, uh, for um, uh, defaults and uh, foreclosures. Um, it is uh, thought that 81% of the homeowners in Las Vegas are underwater. In other words, their uh, mortgage is... Uh, more than uh, is more than uh, what their property is worth. Um, roughly half the uh, homes uh, in Vegas are uh, are short sales, um, and uh, twenty twenty five percent of the inventory is is said to be uh, uh, other real estate owned. Uh, office the office market is now twenty three and a half percent vacant. Uh, the industrial market is now 50, 15% vacant. You remember it was 3% vacant when times were good. Uh, the retail market's over 10% vacant. Uh, there was a time when it was uh, just maybe 1% or 2% uh, vacant. And uh, one of my ex-customers told me that uh, um, who, who has re uh, retail properties, that if he has a tenant come to him and say, gee, I can't pay, he says, well, if you can't pay, that's okay, but don't move out. So I think what you have in Vegas is a whole lot of tenants not paying rent to landlords who can't pay their notes uh, to banks that aren't necessarily owning up to uh, how bad um, the collateral for some of their loans um, actually is. Land prices are, have now fallen to 200000 an acre. You remember they hit a high of nine hundred. They're down to two hundred. Um, but there's virtually no market for land in Las Vegas. 
Uh, if you've got land, you really can't sell it. But interestingly enough, if you have lots, home builders are starting to buy them again. National home builders, uh, they only know one thing, and that's either, you know, they, they got a big tax refund, um, and uh, when they got that tax refund, they're out buying lots in uh, places like Phoenix and California and Atlanta and, and Vegas, so price of lots is actually going up. But um, it's estimated there's $20 billion worth of distressed commercial loans in Vegas. It'll take three to four years to absorb all the vacant property. And uh, to top it all off, um, you remember that uh, unemployment rate of 3.5%. Well, the unemployment rate in Vegas is now 14.5%. So uh, the pain has been felt uh, uh, by everybody uh, in Vegas. Um, and uh, it was felt <laughs> by me as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I wish, uh, I just wish Murray would have been around um, to, uh, we at least had a few laughs during this whole thing. But uh, it was a pleasure to uh, study to under Murray, um, to study uh, the Mississippi bubble, the South Sea bubble, and, um, you know, tulip mania, I just didn't think I'd necessarily be involved directly. But, uh, you know, out of uh, booms and busts come good things. And I hope that all of you have an opportunity. You know, as the uh, bumper sticker uh, in Texas used to say, uh, Lord, just give me one more bubble. I promise I won't screw it up this time. <laughs> um, and I say... I say the same thing. Give me one more boom. I won't screw it up. But uh, I hope you all have the opportunity to uh, uh, have a boom and to get out at the right time because <laughs> booms are very hard to detect when you're inside the bubble instead of on the outside looking in. Thank you. It's time for social. Hour.